good grief. Why is it doing this?
Okay, let's begin. Um, hopefully everyone can hear, hear me. Hope everyone's doing well. And I hope all the Indian students, family are doing well back home, given their new 21 day lockdown. Um, it's for the severest effort so far. They still spent 21 days without leaving the house at all. Um, that must seem pretty challenging. Um, first, we'll take any questions. Um, then we'll move on to looking at earning Spark and the uh, But first, um, you know, there's still some people working on the last assignment. So I'll probably um, release what used to be called the midterm exam, um, probably midweek um, next week to let people give people a chance to get caught up. Um, so any questions? Hopefully the dead silence is not because it's because you have more questions as opposed to um, not having. Thank you, darling. Um, what was the deadline? I have not determined that yet. Um, it's probably not going to be as hard as um, assignment two. Um, but I also want to make sure that people have enough time to, to finish it. Okay, let's um, start then. I want to talk about learning Spark and AWS. Uh, so it's document 19. I need to... So it's document 19, um, Spark on AWS. And we're looking at starting on slide 33. Like I, like I said a number of times, when you run a program on AWS, since it's costing you money and debugging is just going to be harder there. You really want to um, make sure the program runs locally first and then um, upload it to AWS. And so we'll go through the steps of looking at AWS. Um, again, you have to keep in mind that when you run on AWS, you are going to be running the program on multiple machines, um, right? So there's, you know, some driver program on the master node, um, and there's a bunch of worker nodes, depending on how many you want. And then behind the scenes there's a manager, which is basically um, overseeing everything. And there are a number of things that are going to happen behind the scenes. Um, one is when you have data files, S3 is going to distribute them across multiple machines for you. Um, the cluster manager is going to replicate work on more than 
can replicate work if one machine goes down. Um, yeah, so we, we write an application. Um, now, um, if you run a Java program or a Scala program, then it's going to be a main function you write that runs. Um, when you do Python, basically your program is the main. Yeah, the manager is one of going to allocate the resources for you, give you machines, make sure the files run back and forth. Um, and when we deploy it, there's two options for the deploy mode on AWS, and one is cluster, which means um, the, the driver program, your main program is running in the cluster. <laughs> Client means it's running outside the cluster. Um, and yeah, the executor is just a, the process running on the Client side doing all the running all your code, handling various operations. Um, and the task is something you send to the executor. Um, job is the entire thing, being run. And stages. Um, remember when we're doing Spark. There's transformations and there's actions. Um, and so each transformation is going to be in a series of stages. And as typical, I'm going to use a simple program. Um, it's, it's a nice program because it's, you don't worry about input files at all. Um, there's no dependencies, no input files, no input files. It's just pure code. Um, so now we need to um, upload a program and put it into an S3 buckets. Um, so here, here are my S3 buckets. Um, and they said last time on S3 bucket names are global to everyone. Um, and I have one RW696 slides. Um, for some, some reason I put um, put my Pi program in that bucket. And so this is what it looks like when you code S3. Um, you might select on the Pi Pi bucket. Um, we do get, right, this object URL, which gives us the URL. Um, to get to the bucket. Um, and we'll need this um, shortly. Now, how do we run a program in AWS? Well, we have to go um, to, the, to your EMR console. Um, which means you have to create an account in AWS and you'll have to create your account to make sure you sign up for the um, Educate to get $100 credits. Um, and once you've done that, um, you want to go to your EMR console and you'll probably find it's going to take you a little bit longer to find it because it has so many things you can do on AWS. And we want to look at clusters. And there is this uh, create cluster button. Uh, 
when you create a cluster, you can either do it a quick way or you can do a um, more advanced option. Um, even a quick option, um, you can give it, you want to give it your cluster a name. It's, you may want to rerun that cluster, and so then you can, it does also save that cluster configuration, so you need to rerun it, and so that you can go through the steps again, give it a name that makes sense to you. Um, you want to specify what you want to run. We want to run Spark. Um, you can then select what type of machine you want. Um, AWS has a large category of machines. Um, and then we specify how many machines you want, one per master, how many workers do you want. And keep in mind, if you're running three machines, then when you run in each, you run for half hour, you're getting charged um, an hour on each machine, and well, that's three hours. Um, now, we'll talk about this a little later, but you can create a EC2 key pair, um, and what that allows you to do is you can then SSH into your cluster and look at files on the cluster and interact with the cluster directly. Um, it also allows you to, um, using their client, um, submit jobs on your desktop um, on your machine to, the, to your cluster. Uh, for advanced options, again, you can name the cluster. Um, you can also specify in both cases um, uh, so what software you want. You specify again the same thing, what type of options you want to do. Um, then you want Spark. And you go on to various pages. And now we can actually configure um, what types of software we want. And we'll talk about some of these uh, later today. Um, uh -oh. And various options. And the key one is, well, there's two things. Um, what do you want to happen when your program is done? Um, either the cluster can wait and so you can run more programs or it can terminate. You probably don't want to auto terminate at this point. Um, well, because if you run your program and you can run it again and auto terminates, you have to start a new cluster. Starting a cluster can take five or 10 minutes. And every, if you start and stop and start again, remember you're getting a build per hour. So if you run a program for five minutes, it terminates. You start up again in another five minutes. Um, each one of those five minute runs will build you an hour. If you keep it running and run it again um, over and over again, you're going to follow the same cluster. So you want to get operation. And there is this is a key issue um, the step type. And what we need is a Spark application. Um, that's critical for running uh, Python code on AWS. Uh, this, so this Spark application is very important. Uh, the next thing happens is again, we have uh, more options. It shows you um, in this case, I'm you know, more details about the machine I'm using. Um, I'm using sort the of standard M5 large. Um, it's way bigger than we need, or I need. Um,
and then we give it a cluster name. So when, if you want to run it, if I come back tomorrow, I can run the same cluster configuration without having to go through all these steps. Um, I can again select the given EC2 pair, um, which again allows me to log on remotely to that cluster, um, send jobs to it to my desktop. And, and finally, we can create the cluster. And when we do that, um, we get this page. And it will say starting this page is not up out of updates. Um, and it can, like I said, it can take five or 10 minutes for this new customer to come online. And let's see what else. Uh, yes, yeah, so eventually you'll want to go to steps so you can add a job for it to run. And so here we are um, adding a step and right, click on add step. Um, and notice that what's going on now is just set up the duke debugging and the status is pending because it's not done yet. Um, I don't have to wait for this to end, I can just add the step. Um, and again, we talked about the different deploy modes. We need the client, which runs in the cluster. Um, again, we want Spark application. And the application location, um, I have to give it the S3. URL and so it's s3 colon slash slash and the name of my bucket and then the file file name. And what do you want to do if it fails? Um, you know, we can have the cluster stop if we want. You probably don't want to do that. And once you submit it, then as you can see now I got two jobs and they're still both pending, right? So I went through all those slot went through those went through pages, had my job, and I still don't have a running Spark um, system yet. And notice this nice little reload button. Now, once the jobs are run, um, notice that you know, it's you know, the last time it says only 24 seconds for the Spark application startup. But that doesn't include the time to allocate the machines for the cluster. Um, and my, my two seconds in my fork application to 24 seconds. Um, if you want to see the logs or the output to print statements, we have to click on view logs. And when we do that, um, you're going to get a list of different things you're going to look at. Look at, and since we printed printed out, we want to look at the standard outputs. And one warning is that they used pop-up windows to show you the logs. And so, if you're like me, you're going to have to configure your browser to allow pop-up windows. Um, and we'll warn you this saying sorry, but you can't log into email. Enable pop-up windows. 
and you know, there's my output. Now, I don't expect people to have too many questions at this point. Um, but when you do this, oh, I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. Um, there's a number of pieces here you have to get in the right order. Um, if you don't, things don't work. Second example, um, this example is here to help illustrate um, input and output files. Um, I've got a regular Python program that's going to parse the arguments, right? You say, look, um, and I expect the arguments to have an input file and an output file. Um, you know, here's my main program, right? Standard Python go up for Spark, um, get my Spark session, build it, you know, read my input file, um, you know, do some calculation, and then write the output file. And on the bottom of the screen, right, is where my main is, my main just, you know, gets the input file and output file from the arguments um, and then calls my um, function called flight. What's interesting here is not the answer, but what do we have to do to give my program the input file and output file? And again, in my, my Bucket RW696 flight. Um, I've got a, I got that program in a file called flight.py. And now, if my cluster is st still running, all I have to do is add another step to it. Um, and again, it's, you know, Spark application. I can give it a name, um, deploy mode. The, the two important things I've already seen this one is what's the application name, what's the file that contains the program we're going to run. Again, we're using um, S3 buckets. So you know, S3 colon slash slash name your bucket and then file name. So here is the new thing. Um, arguments. Um, and these arguments are going to be given and you know, passed in through to the program. Um, and again, I give it S3, you know, file bucket file names. And so, right, the input is going to be, right, in the bucket flight, um, and there's going to be a file called 2015-summary.json. The reason you didn't see that earlier when I showed you my S3 buckets is I deleted the file and just said I didn't want to keep it there for several years. Um, and then the output, um, again, the bucket and the file name. Now, I'll repeat myself. I said this earlier, but Spark, the default of Spark is not to overwrite a file. Um, so, if you add the step again and don't change the name of the output file, um, you'll get an error message. You'll get an error message um, after the program is run. And then Lots of spread across many parts.
Any questions so far? Hello. 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 Yeah, I think we mute everybody. Yeah. Okay. Um Yeah, you can create um, an EC2 pair um, with instructions. Um, for some reason, I find going through Amazon documentation does take some time to find the right spots, um, but eventually, I find what I need. And then, when you've done that, um, all your key pairs will show up here and you can select it. Um, huh? Let's see. Okay. And once you um, run the cluster, right, with, any, with a key pair, then there'll be a button, a link you can click on, which will give you the URL to connect to your cluster, and that changes each time. And there are various command line tools you can use to run on your desktop to um, launch clusters and configure them. Now, when you have a cluster, um, You need to get the uh, command line export if you want to do things from the command line to that cluster. Click on that, and you get this um, wonderful looking command line. Um, you could generate this by hand, but it's long enough you're never going to want to. Um, also, what I do when I um, have assignments that you're supposed to use AWS. I also ask you to create the um, client command line export so I can in some way verify that you actually were on AWS. So that was sort of a step by step tutorial on how to run a job in AWS. Um, which we will be doing um, very soon. And it's it is sort of sort of follow steps and all, but I want to give you a step by step to have, give you something to start with. Um, and now I want to give a, a brief overview of what they call the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, so Hadoop um, started out and had three main pieces. One was the Hadoop file system, 
which Spark still uses. Um, well, AWS um, replaced it with their own distributed file system, S3, then the MapReduce system, and then the Yarn, which is a tool to manage clusters. Um, since then, people have generated all kinds of different tools. Um, and we're, so far, we've only looked at one. Um, we will be looking at Zookeeper a little later on um, and a few others. But there are a lot of tools out there to do various tasks. Um, it's not just Spark. Um, So a pig um, and the pig comes from pig Latin. Um, so it's basically a high level language um, to run uh, MapReduce programs. Here's an example where you read in a file. Um, right? loop through all the lines, um, run a filter program, you know, do a group by, um, and then count, right? So this is, a, again, a famous example of reading in text and then counting, the, giving a word count, how many times each word um, appears in, in a document. So Hive is just basically for the for the database managers who use the databases in SQL. Um, and again, here is again the word count program using Apache Hive. Um, right, and then the Hive QL is for MapReduce, right, and so it's. Again, a high level way of actually interacting with um, MapReduce in the Duke environment. I don't know if how many of you have heard about Bigtable. Um, you know, initially, Google came out with with the you know their MapReduce system and that led to Hadoop and Spark and later they came out with a big related system called Big Table um, and it's a non-relational distributed database. Um, you know, it's just how do you store all this data in a distributed way um, and fault tolerant. So in case you get the database is across multiple machines, what happens when the machine goes down? What happens to data on the machine? Um, and my plan is um, to look at a, a different um, non-relational distributed database later after the spring break. And just a tool to grab things out of a regulation database and suck it into Hadoop or Spark. Just, it's hard to escape SQL. Um, we've developed decades of experience with it. So another tool to um, have a, you know, a parallel database on Hadoop. Um, Apache Spark, which we you know about. Um, attempt to add machine learning to Hadoop. Um,
you know, one of the things we'll look at after spring break is, is um, streaming. Um, the other problem is, or the situation is, you know, like companies like UPS, on postal service, um, you know, FedEx, they've got lots and lots of vehicles um, running around all the time. Um, and every time they deliver a package, they scan it in, so they got thousands and thousands of sources of data pouring in. Um, how do we then accumulate all that, string that data in to say, you know, spark to process, to give people say an hour update on what's happening. Um, so how do we stream that? Well, Spark has a streaming system, Fling and Storm. Um, uh, no, we stream them in. Um, I'm not sure how I got there. I don't need this. Look at this somehow. This all should have been deleted. Um, so I think, yeah, um, that is about all I want to talk about today. Um, I thought about starting up a new topic, but I didn't think that would be a good idea um, right before a week break. Um, So the only other thing I have is um, how much time we have for exam, at least a week. Um, any questions? So one question with the exam be similar to that of assignment? Yeah, probably, well, I'm not sure it's proper to call it an assignment exam anymore. Yeah, it'll, it'll be doing something similar. As I said earlier, probably not as complicated as assignment two. Any questions? So did you say there were still gonna be group projects for the class or how does that work? The projects? Um, for the projects, you can have groups of up to two people. Okay. Dash that B. Um, I don't expect him to be here. Um, yeah, what what's big? I mean, most of it's hard to find huge assets out there, um, and it can be hard to deal with them. So. You know, I, I don't expect too many people to come on with a five gigabyte database with data set. Uh, most assets I see are much, much smaller. Okay, thank you. Any other questions?
any specific topics? Um, no. Um, I don't like to limit it because different people have different interests, so I don't have any um, any topics in mind. Um, I'm not sure to do this. Um, in the past, when I taught this course, I'll have a class time or two where people will talk about the project ideas. Um, so I guess um, sometime after break, fairly soon, I'll have a, I'll try and do that with Zoom to have different people talk about um, what they want to do for the project. So during the spring break, think about what type of project you want to do, where the data sets may come. And I do this because I, um, I want to make sure the students don't, some students want to, you know, like, want to take it, they want to do everything, right? And they want to take all these images and you're going to do all this fancy image analysis. And that, that may not be possible. And some students is going, well, let me rerun assignment one and let you know um, we should find your own data set. So I want to make sure that your projects aren't too big or too small, too ambitious. Any other questions? Okay, well, everyone have a good break. Um, keep healthy. And I'll be sending you know, emails to class about projects. Um, be working on grading assignments as soon as I can. No other questions, we will end early and you can start your spring break early. <laughs>